um, not only your area, but uh, this community and uh, the many different people who lived here prior. Um, my name is Eric Hernandez. I am a filmmaker um, based in Denver. And while I was with Rocky Mountain PBS for roughly five years, and in that time, I was fortunate enough to uh, travel the state and really, uh, you know, work to not only preserve but celebrate the history of Colorado and, and all the people in the communities that, um, that have been here across the years. Um, I am the descendant of a displaced Aurarian, so my family, we lived on 1234 10th Street, um, so not too far from here, but uh, when I got the opportunity to tell this story, it, um, you know, I've, I've told a lot of documentaries over the years, but this one definitely hit close to home, and it was great to work to not only celebrate my, my family's heritage, but also, you know, the, the very rich and, of course, complex history of of this institution of of the communities who lived here prior and and things like that um while while i'm up here i will thank a couple of people of course the state historical fund who helped fund the documentary um, and for all the work that they've done to help preserve these buildings historic denver as well um a couple of people magdalena gallegos uh francis torres who i believe is over there hello um and uh oh gosh kathy white who helped me uh, find a lot of the historical images and things like that and of course area campus for allowing me to come here with with my cameras and tripods and, and kind of take over for a little bit to help tell this story. Um, no, I mean, you know, we talk about legacy in, in terms of, of history and, and celebration and things like that, but I do see this as a a wonderful story of, you know, both the, the resilience of, of the communities who have lived here, but also the commitment that those people have had over the years to not only preserve this park to preserve these historic buildings, but also, um, you know, to to work to ensure a lifetime of opportunities for for future generations. Um, you know, history is important, and I feel like I learned that a little later in life than I should have. Um, but you know, and, and but having these places, these you know, buildings that we can walk into, that we can touch, that we can have a tactile relationship, is incredibly important. And I think rather than just reading it in a book, being able to visit these places being able to interact with them to to learn within them while also learning the the context around it is is incredibly important um i will also say you know this i cannot tell the entire history of of auraria in in 30 minutes this is a this is a small part i mean there's this documentary was primarily focused around preservation and and the work that i went into preserving ninth street and and telling the context around kind of this this whole area but i mean there's there's history with the um you know, archaeology of of uh, this area. There's obviously a, a deeper history within uh, the communities and the people who have lived here as well. Um, yes, no, but this is uh, this is just a small piece of that history. But I'm I'm honored that I was able to tell this story, and also very honored that I was asked to be here and share this with you. Um, yes, do we have time for questions? You want me to? Okay. Well, I will be at the panel and here afterwards if anyone has any questions, but thank you all very much for coming and I appreciate you um, celebrating this history with us. Oh, I get it. Welcome back, everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started here. My name is Rachel Gross. I'm an assistant professor of history, um, and I am delighted to be here with all of you to hear about more about the history of our campus um, through the voices of Auraria. A special shout out to my students in women and gender history. I'm delighted to have you all here with me. I'm going to introduce our panelists and give them a few questions to start us off, but then I'll invite questions from the audience. And that includes both the folks here in person as well as those listening on Zoom. So you can get ready if you have any questions that you've been dying to ask people who have a connection to the history of our campus. Um, on the far left, we have Eric Hernandez, um, who, as you know, is a filmmaker who helped to create the Auraria documentary we just watched. Um, next, we have Sheila Perez, um, who is an Auraria Historical Advocacy Council member and a displaced Aurarian. She retired after a 30 plus year career as a pediatric animal assisted recreational therapist and is the owner of the Pioneer Four-Legged at Denver Health. Next, we have Nancy Littleford, a first, first generation American native of Denver and a displaced Aurarian. She has a bachelor's degree in English literature from the University of Colorado, Denver, an MA in counseling psychology from Regis and is a licensed professional counselor in private practice. 
And then finally, we have Frances Torres, a retired licensed clinical social worker, an Auraria Historical Advoc Advocacy Council member, and a displaced Aurarian. Her family was a mainstay in the neighborhood, and her father was referred to as the mayor of Ninth Street. So I'd like to invite our panelists to talk a bit more about their personal and family connection to this place, um, starting with Francis. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gary, you're going to answer some questions, maybe? You're OK? I'm good, yeah. Okay. You're also welcome to stand up here, Francis. Sure. Okay. 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 I'd like to thank the, our indigenous neighbors or ancestors for coming here today because I did not know the history when I was living here and I lived on 9th Street and I had family that knew our own history but we were not told and it was not in the books and in, in in our school books about the history of our community and i'd like to re recognize them for coming today and telling sharing that with me i represent the torres family the onisimo torres family that came here in 1916 from Northern Mexico. I also represent the Lopez family that came here from New Mexico in 1924. So my roots go pretty far back, but I'm, I'm not that old. <laughs> I was 19 years old when the, in 1972 when the displacement happened. So, I always keep in mind my own development and place in the world when I talk about the displacement. So if you could just keep that in your memory as I tell you about my experiences. Um, like many Westsiders, my, my parents never let us forget who we were, where we came from. They shared the value of community and we were based here at St. Cajetan's. But during the displacement and during my time here, I also had the, the good fortune of being able to walk around this community and to feel safe. And when I talk about that, I want people to know that I, it wasn't just me that said that. If you read our oral, oral histories, you will read how we just, felt so connected to each other as families. And it, and it wasn't perfect. I mean, there was everything that a family, that families could do to be together. I had a sister who lived on 10th Street. I had a sister who lived on 8th Street. I had an aunt who lived across the street. I had another sister who lived next door. But that was how we thrived in this neighborhood and in this church. And we weren't all Catholic. And I have to remember that too, because we were so involved in, in church here, in spiritual practices. There were non-Catholics that lived on 9th Street and they came to our events at St. Cajetan's. And some of them went to St. Elizabeth's and some of them attended churches that were here before I was born. So, like in my family, we felt like this was just a small town, but we were also very close to downtown. And I like to talk about that because it was part of our identity. Being downtown meant that we could pay our bills, we could find transportation, we could go shopping, we could find entertainment, and all of those things being so handy to us made us feel not as marginalized as some communities might have during that time. I personally believe we started to feel more marginalized as we learned about the displacement and as people were labeling us blighted. 
I never thought of my neighborhood as being blighted. <laughs> anyway, what we did for the most part is live here with each other in a cooperative kind of way. And it wasn't always said that. It, we didn't always state those values, but they were there. My father gets well-deserved credit for being a community leader and a mainstay, but I'd like to talk more about my mother today. Like many women in, in our community, my mother kept the spirit alive with a five o'clock rosary that she prayed with women and Paco Santos at five o'clock every day. In 1963, when JFK was assassinated, all of those women prayed. They prayed with each other. And the neighborhood was very quiet. It was really a time where I believe we felt more connected to what was going on nationally than in our neighborhood. Then there was the flood of 1965. The flood, the waters didn't reach 9th Street, but it impacted a lot of the families that we knew that attended and attended this church. So to give you an idea of what my older brother and I did, we snuck out of the house at 1033 9th Street. We walked to Cherry Creek to see the rising flood. And when we got there, we looked across Spear, and we saw all these flashing lights. And I remember thinking then, there really was a flood. And I think it was because it, and I, well, I know it was because at that time, information wasn't as easy to get as it is now. But we knew there was a flood, and we knew that our friends and some family were being impacted. Anyway, so the police did come to our neighborhood to tell us about the flood. They didn't knock on our doors. They didn't tell us to evacuate. They cruised the area. And I always do speak about the police during my years, during the displacement. The police station was on 14th and Arapaho, right across uh, Cherry Creek. So we, we always knew it was there, but during that time, my memory is that the police would come to our neighborhood and they would actually rough up one of one of my neighbors. And um, we later found out it was possession, it was for possession of marijuana. And I never really felt quite protected with police presence in this neighborhood. I speak for myself, but witnessing those kind of things always just made me a little unsure of them well maybe a lot unsure but then but then at the same time i remember walking in the middle of the street i mean that's how we felt about the neighborhood we used to cross with in the middle and not at the corners and a police car would come by and they'd yell out of their car cross at the corner stand at the middle of the street and I think to myself, they really could have ticketed us and made a lot of money for the city, but they didn't. So there's different ways of looking at our neighborhood, and that's just my particular uh, memory. So anyway, besides praying, my mom provided a lot of child care in this neighborhood. And uh, recently, one of the Gonzalez uh, descendants reminded me that my mother provide a child care for his parents. And I believe that there were a lot of families that thought that some of those kids belonged to us. My mother wasn't always compensated monetarily. And that's how a lot of other women operated in this neighborhood. One of her friends was my adopted grandma Celestina who lived right across the alley. Okay, she was from Wagon Mound, New Mexico. She and my mother shared some very similar values based on where they came from. But 
they prayed and they cleaned. And after my grandma Celestina, who my adopted grandma Celestina, who I really didn't know was not my grandma until I met her real grandchildren, she would come to our house and she would lay on the couch and her long, beautiful braid would just flutter over the floor heater. And I would think, what is she doing that makes her so tired? And then I realized all the work that Grandma Celestina and my mother and all the women that used to sweep the alleys in our neighborhood, what they were doing. Um, my mother also had women friends who walked from Auraria to the Denver Auditorium to see wrestling. <laughs> It was the funniest thing to see these little old ladies walk and they would see the male wrestlers. And again, that was because we had access to downtown and some and resources. I was warned by my parents about going downtown and about being a, a, a Mexican, a little Mexican American girl with sticky fingers. So we really, so we never went downtown by ourselves. But what we did do was we went together. We enjoyed our neighborhood. We enjoyed the resources around there, around here. I also remember the library because the library was really handy for us. And I, and I, tell my friends at the library this all the time. There was a children's museum at the library we didn't feel terribly comfortable in, my brother and I, when we participated in the summer reading programs across the street here from St. Cajetan's. But we did find a way to feel welcome. We went into the young adult section. And so as displaced Aurarians, as Aurarians, we did have some problems as we all know we were displaced we were disturbed we were dispersed we were upset but we loved our community enough and as far as the scholarship and the reparations that are made that are being made to displaced Aurarians I have to say thank you for that because education was such a value in our community that just knowing that at least the move, the displacement resulted in something for future generations that you can never replace. And that's what I was taught. Thank you. Thanks everyone for being here. So my family is uh, a smattering of non-Hispanic community members. And I didn't find out I was a displaced Aurarian until about three years ago when my son was going to be starting um, college at MSU. And we were at a parent orientation and I was sitting with some other folks and it was very quiet and I just felt compelled to entertain people. So I was sharing the story of how when I was born, my parents lived at 7th and Curtis. And another parent at the table said, oh, are you one of those families that gets free tuition for being asked to leave? And I was like, no, my parents bought a house in Lakewood. And I don't know what you're talking about. So I then thought about it a little bit more. I did some research. I accessed Denver Public Library's archives, got some information. I talked to my mother about why we left. And she said, oh, honey, we were asked to leave. We were told we had to go. And so um, finding out that we were displaced Aurarians was a little like winning the lottery. And I, I know, of course, right, there's this economic component of finding out that you have this free tuition at any of these schools, right? So economically, um, you get this, this money that kind of lands in your lap. Um, 
myself, my daughter, we didn't know about the scholarship, so we can't not mention the fact that crippling student loan debt prevents us from succeeding economically, owning homes and things like that. But the other ways that it really felt like winning the lottery was um, for the opportunity, right? That people have the scholarship available to them um, so that they can open their worlds and get higher education. And we know that higher education offers people more opportunity. For me, as um, I'll just tell you, my parents came here in 1961 from Croatia. They were refugees who escaped Tito's regime in Croatia and fled in the middle of the night to Italy um, with literally, my mom says, a loaf of bread and a salami. Uh, they were sponsored here by Catholic Charities in 1961, and they lived in the basement of the Ave Maria Health Clinic. That clinic was started in 1935 by a group of Catholic nuns, and it was funded, it was built through monies from the Catholic Charities and also the J.K. Mullen Foundation. All of the staff were not paid, the doctors and nurses, it was volunteer. Uh, people did not have to pay for services there. They could get, they could see a physician, there was a dentist there, there was maternal care. And in the basement of this clinic, initially in the 1930s, it was used to feed 300 elementary school age kids who were going to St. Cajetan's, St. Elizabeth's, and the Lawrence Street Public School. At some point, that basement was, was made into an apartment, and my parents lived there for almost a decade. In return for being sponsored here, they cleaned the clinic, they maintained the grounds. It was a large piece of property that was gated. My dad learned to become an electrician here like he was where he came from. And my parents were here until they were, were asked to leave. So the other piece of that, feel like I'm, I won the lottery, was that suddenly, um, after not having a community, right? This isn't Chicago, it's not Ohio, it's not New York. There wasn't a huge, distinct, Slavic, European, ethnic group here. From not having any kind of community or any roots in Denver, suddenly it was winning the lottery of belonging to a group of people and, and having a community. And it was just really, really life altering for me to, to have roots and to feel like I suddenly belonged, um, belonged here. So that's my story. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Sheila Perez Kindle. I was born at 1004 Champa Street. My family moved here to Auraria about 1952 from Rock Springs, Wyoming. My mother was actually born in Riverton, um, which the uh, gentleman mentioned earlier. I wanted to um, recognize my parents, Luis Perez and Josephine Perez, who were um, just very devoted family people and hardworking people. They um, really encouraged education throughout our lifetimes and wanted us to really excel. Um, we came here, as I said, um, they, they came here in 1952. I was born later. And uh, after I was born, we moved to a, another a place at 915 Curtis. So we were here for a, a period of time and I was baptized in this church. Um, and then I made my first Holy Communion over at St. Elizabeth. But I wanted to also say that my first job was at St. Elizabeth at 10 years old. I was uh, doing uh, child care for an ESL. Uh, a nun was teaching English to um, Spanish-speaking citizens, uh, or maybe not citizens, but perhaps people that needed the education. But um, our family, my older brothers, my older brother and sister went to uh, here to St. Cajetan to school. But um, the rest of the kids, because tuition was expensive, we were not able to go. We were actually walked over Colfax to Greenlee Elementary. Um, but I remember some of the times and some of the things that some were mentioned here. Francis mentioned the feeling of safety in the community. We were able to play outside, and you know, we always felt that there was a time to, we knew when what time to come in, but we always felt safe. There was not a time ever during the, my period of time here that I felt unsafe. We had a lot of friends, we were able to play. There was a lot of um, concrete that was broken. There were areas that were 
um, not fixed up. There were places that uh, just, we were able to play in places that you wouldn't imagine. <laughs> but uh, those are things that I remember. And I think that just remembering those things helps me to think about our lives. I mean, we've, we've come a long, long way, but there's still so much, so much to see and so much to do and, and so much to educate other people about. So I want you to know that we were educated. When I came, when I, it was time for me to go to college, I asked uh, the financial aid office at UCD about the scholarship. No one seemed to know. Went to Metro uh, to see if there was an opportunity there. No, no one seemed to know. And so I really think that, you know, the promises that were made that were not kept until now were need to be recognized. Um, I did, was not able to get the scholarship throughout. I got to my BA here at uh, uh, UCD, but uh, and now some of my family is are taking advantage of the scholarship. My nephews and great nieces are are doing their thing, and I'm so very proud of that. Knowing that the work that Norbert and the people did uh, to get the scholarships is an important part of what we're talking about here. I think that people need to be educated. People need to be identified um, and given what is rightly due. Dura, when Dura came in, the uh, Denver Urban Renewal, they made so many promises about what we would be um, given. We were off, we said that they told us that we would have access to education. We would be, have access to the amenities like the library and the gym and the pool and all of those things. During that period of time, none of that was right after, none of it was given until now and things are being changed and of course we've been given um, an opportunity but i just want you to know that we are still here just as our uh, native elders had recognized that earlier we're not going anywhere and we're going to let more people know about this thank you Hello, um, my name is Eric Hernandez. I am a descendant of displaced Aurarians. So my family, we lived on 1235 10th Street. Um, so not too far from here. And I mean, my my family's roots in, in this area run, run pretty deep. I um, my, my parents were married in, in St. Elizabeth's. My, my dad is an adjunct professor uh, with Metro. My uh, other family cousins have and are currently utilizing the scholarship um, and I I went out of state actually for uh, for college but I hope to utilize the the opportunity here in the near future um, I mean for me I always knew um, you know my, my family would always tell us that you know we have we have history here that we've been here um, and I'm I'm a seventh generation Coloradan as well so you know fortunate enough to um, to have strong roots within our, our great state um, but you know, I my personal uh, journey with with understanding the history really came from the opportunity to make the documentary, and you know, a lot of times I think we uh, take things for granted, right? We we don't necessarily ask ask further questions or deeper questions, and that's what this experience for me allowed me to do. And so, you know, I, I got to spend time with my grandma and say, you know, tell me, hey, do you have any photos of of the house? And so I I did slip those in the documentary, um, you know, uh, and things like that, but. Uh, you know, I got to hear the stories of, oh, yes, hey, this is this is where we live. This is, you know, kind of who this is where we came from, who we are. And and I think understanding, uh, you know, where we come from not only helps us prepare for the future, but it it gives us a greater appreciation for, you know, for, for where we are in our, our current time, for what our families have done to give us the opportunities to be here and and things like that. Um, and so my my big hope with the with telling the story of of the or part of the story with my documentary was to not only celebrate the the complex but rich history of this area of, of our people of our families friends and communities um but also to hopefully uh, be that next stepping stone in um in other people's journeys to say okay cool hey this piqued my interest and now i can you know take that one step further either find out if if you're a descendant of a displaced terrarian or you know to have, get greater appreciation for for the history um of, of our state and of our of our city and, and things like that. Um, no, but I, my story is a little different, but I'm still have, very happy to be here. Thank you. <laughs> uh, 
So Eric, your documentary very rightfully focused on uh, the historic preservation of Ninth Street. Um, and if you all have a chance to go on one of our tours, either today at lunch or later on today or tomorrow, many of you will be able to walk um, uh, in front of many of those historic structures. But the stories that you as a group just told prompt us to think further about what should be included in our memories of the Auraria neighborhood. So I'm hoping each of you could tell us a story about your families or what you remember that help us understand the history of this place, not just as one historic block, but rather as a neighborhood as a whole. So that could be a story from another street, for instance, or perhaps ways that you understood or your family understood this place as a connected neighborhood. And we'll start down on that end with um, Eric and then go this way. Oh boy. Um, well, I think, you know, we, uh, as, as a community, um, you know, and, and as a culture, I think a lot of time we, we focus on our traditions. We focus on, you know, the, the history of where we come from and, and things like that. And one of, um, well, to talk about more tradition. So my, my family, we've had a, about a hundred plus year old tradition of making a, a Christmas altar or a nascimento um, every Christmas. And uh, it, it started with a small table and then, you know, it's grown over the years to kind of take over a living room and, and things like that. But it's a multi-generational tradition um, and a multi-generational participation event that we, uh, that we uh, have during the holidays. And, um, you know, kind of bringing back our roots to Auraria was part of the, um, we have this kind of lace, um, oh gosh, I'm, I'm not remembering what it's called, but we uh, we drape this um, kind of beautiful uh, knit lace uh, kind of fabric over um, to hide the, the legs of the table. And that came from the altar here at St. Cadgett. Um, and so my, my grandparents were very well connected um, with his community as you know, some of your families were as well. Um, but, you know, and I, I, now that I'm on the spot, I'm gonna remember <laughs> a little less, I think, but, you know, one thing that uh, whenever I talk with my my parents or, or my grandparents or things like that, we always hear just the the beautiful stories of of the beautiful uh, and you know kind of tolerant community that was here, right? We had a um, a multi ethnic, multi racial community that that was celebrated and that was um, you know a, a mutualista society, right? And so we we helped each other, we supported each other, and I think that you know that has been passed on from from generation to generation. And um, I think that's what we're also here trying to do as well is take that next step and do what we can to um, to help one another and to, um, yes, definitely get the word out that the opportunity exists. And I think that's um, something that we're, uh, that was unfortunate when it was first released, but that so many people have worked very hard to say that the opportunity for the scholarship um, is, is not only present, but that we're trying to get the news out to all the families that, that are eligible. Eric's story triggered a story that I had been thinking about for a long time, but only remembered this moment. And that's, we, it's this, we, we had a big family and we were known for having a lot of kids. And a lot of those kids, as I mentioned earlier, were children that my mother cared for, but a lot of them were some of my nieces and nephews who also grew up in this neighborhood. Well, every year we seem to have a new baby Jesus. So, so we were the family that had the current baby Jesus on 9th Street. <laughs> so that's my story. <laughs> when I was thinking about uh, a story, um, when we had moved to, to the second uh, place, it was a, a brownstone building. It was a terrace building that had probably about maybe six families there. Um, it was, there was like a uh, little area where you can go through the middle of the building. It was like a little archway that you walk through. And I wish that I had a picture of the building because it was so beautiful. It was the, the front of the, the rock was just fabulous. It was just a, a beautiful place. And I didn't really think about it till like late, most more recently, of course, because I was very young at the time. But I remember that walkway and we would run through it and just play, always play. There were so many, so many children in the neighborhood that we could play with all the time. And when I mentioned earlier that about the safety of community, we were all over this area. We were not just on our little spot. We were, we would play all over. So it was just a fun, fun time. The place was uh, just like a, a short, it was kind of like an apartment but to the right out the back door was where the um, clothesline was. 
So it was right next, almost next to the back door. So I remember that we would run through the sheets and run through the, you know, the clothes and we just have a, the time of our life all the time play. And it was just a, a great community. Um, but I, I did remember that there were some ash pits where the, where the trash would be burned. One day, a girl, uh, her, she had a, a, like a tool dress and it caught on fire and the little girl got really terribly burned. And I remember that story so clearly uh, because it was just such a tragedy. It was such a, a, a bad, bad thing that happened. But that, re that made me recall the, the trash pits in the area. There were a lot of them. So just wanted to tell you about that. But one other thing too, there were some um, uh, train tracks. So the, a lot of the kids would have the whistles, those little uh, metal whistles that come from the train tracks. So everybody had whistles all the time. So those are just some, some memories of that time. Gosh, I mean, I wish I had some community uh, stories to share. I, my parents were new immigrants and they were very young. My mom was 19, my dad was 21, and they didn't speak the language and they lived in a gated residence and my brothers were born very quickly. And so I think there was just a lot of work. There was a lot of work in learning the language and figuring out how to how to exist as people in a foreign country with um, not knowing anyone. But the one thing that I do remember my mom saying is similar to the restaurant was that the Ave Maria Clinic was where people gathered. It's where needs were met. My mom said there was a large storage room that had baby clothes and cribs and equipment and clothes for adults and things that the people in the community might need. So it really was a place for the community to get healthcare services, to um, get support and help when they were really struggling. So that's that's the only story I've got about it. I do have lots more questions for our experts, but I wanted to open it up to our audiences um, as well. Anybody have any questions? And I, you can say it out loud and I can repeat it up here, or if the microphone finds you in time, there it is over there, then you can also wait for the microphone. Testing. Yes, can you uh, talk about the, the bazaar, the St. Gadsden's Bazaar and, and the amount of work that went into it, and especially the cooks that provided the food? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jay's looking at me because because <laughs> we've known each other since St. Cadetons and St. Elizabeth's days when there was a big competition between the two schools. But I did mention the events earlier and we did have these really fantastic bazaars with the best Mexican food that you could ever taste that came from people in the community and not only the Auraria community, we had family and friends on the other side of Colfax. And of course, there was a time when we didn't know we were Aurarians, we were Westsiders. So I know what Jay's talking about, because I know Jay, and I know that there was such interest from the Mexican American community. And it was people that you didn't see for years at our bazaars, or it was food that you might've forgotten how it tasted. And even as, as just as important as having fun, they were our fundraisers. When you look at this church now that we're in, and I come in here and I look in, at this church because I was raised in this church, I always look for the water stain that used to be right there. And it's not there anymore. And I just remember we used to fundraise, we used to sell holy cards, holy stamps, holy everything. And that water stain was still there. <laughs> so did I answer your question, Jane? <laughs> About, about the, the entire community, you know, when I when I think of the bazaar, I think about going downstairs with my grandma was cooking down there with all of the other grandmas in the neighborhood. 
-hmm. and they come out with their aprons and you know they shake their finger at you but sit you down and feed you you know <laughs> and you go across the street and try your luck at the chuck -a luck and the princesses that sold raffle tickets and it wasn't a popularity in terms of you know their looks it was how many raffle tickets you could sell you know that kind of thing so fundraising that's how we stayed alive we walked around selling everything for seemed like 75 percent of the year but it was a community event and people came because they lived here the people who lived here previously the community they had such strong connections and, and they left so many so, so many family members in our neighborhood that they would always come back and people still think and so do i to this day that these people live that the people that came back and their relatives were just part of the community and the the women that cooked that made the tamales that watched us they were a very important part of the community and so were all those beauty queens <laughs> Now, did I answer your question? <laughs> Other questions? Oh yeah, all the, all the way in the back. Thanks, Erica. So this is a little different. Everyone who comes to America um, decides how they're gonna become American how much of their original culture they're gonna keep, how much they're gonna get rid of, whether how it's gonna blend. And I'm kind of curious if living in a really diverse neighborhood had any effect on how you, your families, in Eric's case, older generations, uh, blended into the culture. Yeah, I mean, my parents came here to be Americans, so they assimilated. They they were really young, and they had my brothers right right as they immigrated here. And my brothers did start out in at school with the nuns at St. Elizabeth's, and they had a run in with a nun who forced my brother to eat lunch when he wasn't feeling well, and then he promptly threw it all up on the lunch table. So then my mom uh, yanked him out and took took him across Colfax to Greenlee Elementary. But my brother started school not speaking English all that well, and they had trouble in school. So my parents decided at that point that they would only ever speak English at home. So although I'm a first generation American, I do not speak my parents' language, which uh, I'm mostly angry and resentful about now. But my parents did it for the reason that a lot of their generation did. They came here to be Americans and they assimilated and they didn't really know or seek out um, other folks who were from Croatia or maybe uh, close, close countries. So the assimilation was 100% um, all in. Um, that's how that happened. It's a great question. Oh. Um, my father's Mexican and Chinese, and um, we, my cousins were a little older than I was, and some of them were older than my other siblings, and some of my cousins uh, spoke Spanish in school and were chastised about that, so we were not taught Spanish in the home, so I had to learn Spanish at a later time, but um, that was why we weren't speaking the, our native language, our, our Spanish language. So um, I, I don't know if that answers your question or if that's really what you need to hear. I'll, I'll tell you what my mother used to tell us. She, she said, you're going to speak good English. We didn't learn Spanish at home but we heard it i heard it in this church i heard it in the songs that we used to sing 
that the nuns who didn't speak Spanish at all, they were from Atchison, Kansas, the Benedictines, but, but we were fortunate enough at St. Catchington School to have music and not curriculum and unfortunately not not the history because that wasn't part of what the educational system was like then i mean we're talking the 60s early 60s mm -hmm. late 50s mm -hmm. but that was how we got our culture and it was reinforced it was reinforced by the shared values that sheila talks about and and nancy too because we were an open community and and when i talk about saint elizabeth and i think about the students that went there too i remember that they did speak some german so it wasn't just us that assimilated that wanted to be an american it was also the German population that lost their language. And um, they, I don't, I can't say to their instruction, but I believe that at the time they didn't, we didn't have the history. We didn't have Chicano history. We didn't have Mexican American history. We went to college to learn all about that. <laughs> That's what happened. Um, yeah, um, I mean, I, my, obviously my, my story is talking about, you know, my, my parents, my grandparents and great grandparents and, and things like that. But, you know, I mean, my, um, I'm fortunate enough. My, my mom is a historian and genealogist and, you know, so she's chased our, our family back 15 generations. Um, uh, one of our, um, uh, my 15th great grandfather was a conquistador with uh, Juan de Oñate who settled in what is now New Mexico in 1596. And then my family, we kind of moved north um, all, the, all the way from New Mexico to, to Wyoming over the years. Um, so, but I, I think, you know, that's, that's something that a lot of people don't, don't fully know is, is, our, is our, our family history, our lineage, and, and where we come from. Um, you know, I mean, my, my grandparents, whether it was with, uh, with schooling or in the military with World War II or, or things like that, right, they um, were told quite often, you know, you, you speak English, not Spanish. Um, and I think that definitely affected, um, you know, the, the later generations as well. I mean, my, I didn't learn Spanish at home. I, I learned it in school. Um, and, and now I'm really uh, trying to find more opportunities to, to use it. Um, but, you know, my, my parents um, can speak it. My, my grandparents obviously are, are fluent as well. So, you know, we, we do have some of those experiences that, that many marginalized communities um, have just with part of, you know, finding both a, a way to to stay successful within within a, a society or or a, a country that um, wants you or kind of in some ways forces you to assimilate but in other ways I think all um, you know any any minority community or family or or people we all we all have found ways to um, you know whether you can call them small acts of defiance or you can call them you know just uh, um, saying staying true to, to who we are and where we come from but I think the the traditions that we that we continue the the foods that, that we continue to make right the the stories that we tell each other those are the um, the the things that are passed down from generation to generation and you know like the we're all all of us are trying to make uh, tortillas as good as my grandma, which only only one person is able to do right now. Uh, Matt, you should teach me the recipe, please. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, and, and things like that, or the traditions that we have of, um, you know, for my family, the, the Christmas nacimiento and, and things like that. So, you know, I, I think it's all about finding, you know, finding a balance of, yes, I mean, you know, part, part of being an American is, is, um, is knowing or understanding, you know, parts of parts of the society and how it operates. But I think as well, taking that one step further, also part of being an American is understanding that America is is a melting pot, right? It comes from with people of different different backgrounds and languages and cultures and traditions, and that's what gives it, um, I think, its strength as well. I saw another question in the back. You actually kind of answered my question. I was going to ask, um, how is the simulation? affected your family today and what are the outlets that you have taken to retrieve, retrieve your lost culture? Yeah, um, well, kind of, kind of continuing, I'm, I'm really fortunate that um, my, my mom is, is a geologist and historian. And so I've been able to 
uh, learn a lot of kind of where, where we come from and, and our family story and, and the story of, uh, you know, just Hispanic Americans um, through her and, and understand that way. You know, like I said, I'm, um, I'm still trying to practice my Spanish. I'm, I wouldn't call myself fluent, but I'd say semi-fluent. Um, but I think, you know, I, I've been fortunate both from, from just who, the, the jobs that my family has had, but also uh, my job as, as a storyteller, as a filmmaker, as a documentarian, um, is, is about, you know, exploring, exploring history, exploring the stories, exploring, you know, kind of where we come from. And um, uh, for me that, you know, that's, that's a lifelong pursuit, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate that I've been able to both learn about my family through, through my work and through my passions, while also learning larger about, about our state and, and about our country as well. I'll just chime in and say it's a little harder if your language is a little more obscure. It's not like I can find learn Croatian on Duolingo or Babel or Rosetta Stone or anything like that. So I think it's potentially something that might be lost um, to me and my kids uh, unless we travel there and do an immersive program or um, and there isn't uh, much of our Croatian community here still. There is one down in Pueblo that I recently learned about and um, we seek out, we seek it out. Uh, my kids and I are actually traveling to Seattle this week to go to Croatia Fest. Um, there's some large Croatian communities out in Seattle. There's other areas of the country where we can be exposed, but um, I think the assimilation is almost so complete that now we have to go back and chase our roots and chase our, our ethnicity um, and our culture. Um, we have to we have to reclaim it in a way because it was so completely given up. I felt that living on Ninth Street and having the experiences that I described before, I thought I was assimilated. <laughs> but I learned later that there was so much more out there that I didn't know about. And when I went to a primarily uh, white Catholic high school, I really freaked some of my new friends out because I knew a lot of the lyrics to a lot of the Broadway musicals that we used to go downtown to see. So I guess I thought I was assimilated, but the beauty of it all is that I've been able to hang around Denver and I have a really large family with a lot of grown baby Jesus <laughs> that we just remind each other. And um, that's how we assimilated. Did I, did I answer your question back there? I know she, okay. Erica's in charge. Next question. <laughs> Just like to mention a few things about your language loss. Not born into it, not being taught your language at home. The same thing happened with the Native American. They tried to assimilate us into the non-Indian world. By doing that, they would punish our ancestors, our grandpas and grandmas. They, they didn't send their kids to school. The government ran these boarding schools all over the United States. And one of them comes to mind is Carlisle, Carlisle there in Pennsylvania. We had several of our Arapaho kids sent to Carlisle. A lot of them didn't make it back. They died there, they were buried there. Their families back home never got to see them again. But there, they were denied their language and their culture. And those boarding schools in our area of the woods here in Wyoming, 
we had two boarding schools run by the Catholic and one run by the Episcopalian. The one at St. Stephen's in my neck of the woods. My grandpas and my grandmas, they went to school there and at the government school up at Fort Waskey, which is about 30 miles away. There, they were denied their culture, their religion, and their language. In my mom and dad's time, they were in the boarding school there at St. Stephen's, St. Michael's. And they were denied their language and their culture. If they were caught speaking their Rappo language, they were punished severely. They were whipped. They were starved. Denied their meals at that school. They were given hard labor to pay back for breaking those rules. And when my father and mother became parents, they made a pact. They said, we're not going to speak a rap whole language around our kids. We don't want them to experience the same things we did. Because we went to St. Stephen's School too growing up. We don't want them to speak the language, so we won't speak the language around them. My mom would cheat, though, when my dad would be out working. She's the one that would speak rapo to us. It was really harsh, tough at those times, you know. Today we have over 11,000, close to 12,000 Arapaho people on a reservation. And maybe about 10% of them are fluent speakers. And that's it. Out of that whole number of people, Arapaho people. But we're working hard back home to revitalize that language. We've been working on it the past 25, 30 years. Because our elders say without that language, we don't have a culture. We don't have a religion. When we pass on, our ancestors won't understand us when we meet up with them. You know, it's really, it's really sad that we've uh, been denied that language, and especially our culture too. We were we were banned from practicing our religions, our sun dance. The government shut us down. If we were caught doing that, we'd get punished. We just got our sun dance back here back in the 1930s. We started doing that again. Yeah, it's a really tough situation what the federal government had done to our people. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, UG. so we're working hard back home now to yeah. establish immersion schools and getting the language back into the state, you know, the tribal uh, schools that we have back home. But I, I understand, you know, where you're coming from with your language. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I, I feel such sadness and pain for the systemic racism and oppression that your folks, your people have suffered. Thank you for sharing that perspective. I mean, for me as a first-gen American, my parents came here to live the American dream. And part of that was that their kids be educated, their kids know how to spell, their kids know how to speak. And so I think it was less nefarious on their part to not teach us the language. They just wanted us to be successful Americans. Um, but I understand how, I understand now as uh, a grown adult that 
the loss of language can also mean loss of identity. So thank you so much for sharing that. It looks like we have a question from the internet land. Uh, okay, the next one. Great, thank you. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'm Gail Richard, Northern, Northern Arapahoe Science Creek representative. <clears throat> My brother and I just did a presentation. I brought the uh, extra handouts there of what we talked about this morning. You can get yourself copies there. And, uh, but I just want to reiterate, you know, what he's talking about, the, about the loss of language and culture. And uh, it was establishment of religion and boarding schools. That was a Indian Removal Act. And it was passed in 1830. It empowered the president of the United States to move Eastern North America and west of the Mississippi to what was the Indian Territory now in Oklahoma. In 1979, Carlisle Borden School opened, what my brother was talking about. And this was located in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, under the direction of Richard Harry Henry Pratt a former American officer. Pratt's opinion of Indians that he once stated, a great general has said that the only good Indian is a dead one. Now, therefore, when you're a young person and a family member, uh, it all reverts back to healing. Right now, we're in the healing process historical and generational, because the loss of language, loss of culture, loss of uh, practices and religion up the, till, the, till the 1930s. Okay, at the time, on our reservation, there was 73 of our students that were sent to Carlisle Indian School. And when it was shut down, only 26 survived and Carlisle Indian School, school was a nest of contagion with tuberculosis taking most of the lives eye disease was extremely common those who survived were kept at the boarding school for years at a time now Carlisle Indian School became a model of other boarding schools across the nation. Some of its practices would never be used in public schools. Military discipline was imposed with the boys and girls organized into army-like units, drilled in elaborate marching routines. The goal of the military structure was to strip down the natives to our core. The boards of schools had to completely erase everything Native children had learned. The schools had to completely assimilate them completely in American culture. Pratt modeled Carlisle and, and off reservation board schools on school he developed at Fort Marion Prison. And interestingly enough, after the Sand Creek Massacre, Cheyenne Arapaho survivors were, were called uh, um, enemies of the enemies enemies of the country, and they were sent to Carlisle in Carlisle, uh, Fort Marion, Florida, and a lot of them were there for six years. Our, one of our family uh, that was there spent six years, and, and, and then there was an array of other tribes, and then one main person in that camp was uh, Geronimo. They, they released him after six years, and Geronimo was sent, he was sent to New Mexico. And I think presently he's buried in Oklahoma. I'm not too sure of that. Is that right? 
Gail, yeah. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I want to make sure we have time also to get that question that was coming from Zoom. But but I hope folks will will continue to follow up. Thank you for sharing that story. Hi, everyone. So a uh, question from Zoom, kind of similar along these same lines. Uh, in being displaced, did you resent or feel you lost the community you grew up in? Uh, I'm interested to hear about the new communities you found after displacement and how the displaced community worked to maintain community with those that they were separated from. Um, I, I'd like to speak to that. I, after we left here, after we left Auraria, um, our family moved to, to Calumet Street, which was right across the street from Greenlee Elementary. So we maintained our West Side um, strength I should say, um, I felt that again, we were in a, a safe community and we continued with our same traditions, of course. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question. If you, I hope that that's answering some of it. We, we still had a strong community after leaving this area. Well, my large family moved to North Denver. And um, I, I really don't know why, but I do believe because there was a migration of a lot of our community that way uh, north and also the migration went south, southwest further than what Sheila's talking about. So, I found my community by just being myself. I, I, I enjoy the community I live in now. And the way I can answer that is that I learned how to be a community member by being raised in this community. One of the things I, I think that should be kind of talked about a little bit is redlining was occurring throughout the city. We were not able to live in certain areas still at that point. So, and even now, I think that that's something that should be addressed. Redlining was something that needs to be addressed and we are not addressing it at, at this moment. And to address that second part of the question, how are the displaced Aurarians continuing or starting again to build community? And we have the, the group that we all belong to, the uh, Auraria Historical Advocacy Council. and. The goal of that is to meet each other, know each other, and really work toward this common goal of outreach to people who may have lived in this community and who were like me and didn't know they were displaced Aurarians or descendants of displaced Aurarians so that they can benefit from the scholarship and get an education and get opportunity and feel a part of the community. So we get together once a month. Um, we partner with History Colorado. We're working all together with the universities to create a welcome center and a library of documents and a roster of displaced Aurarians. I think that's how we're working to continue to um, foster a sense of community together as displaced Aurarians and their descendants. I, I appreciate you all being up here and sharing your perspectives. And yes, Eric, I will teach you how to make grandma's tortillas. Thank you. Uh, I'm actually curious for the people who lived, who grew up in the neighborhood and maybe whose children or grandchildren are receiving the scholarships. Do you have thoughts on um, what your hopes are for the recipients of the displaced Aurarian scholarships and maybe any sense of responsibility that they have uh, to the community? Are there things that you would hope that they would um, do or uh, ways in which they would maintain connected to the history of this neighborhood as they pursue their education? I have a couple of great nieces here today that I'm looking at because I really want the descendants that you're talking about, the descendants of the Taurus family that have received the scholarship that we work for. Uh, and 
it's up to us. I, I believe it's up to me to teach them and about our history through these kind of symposiums and events. And that's another thing that our council is continually trying to accomplish that outreach to displaced Sararians. But I guess it, it's, it's really up to them. What happened was that because we were displaced in the early 70s and there were no buildings on this campus, my generation and, and my older siblings that were in school, we didn't have a place to go to school because there were no buildings here. And the scholarship criteria is that you come to school on this campus. So I was fortunate enough to have people in my life that steered me towards education. I didn't use this scholarship. And what I expect out of myself, out of having that opportunity to for an education, a good education, I expect of my descend uh, well, they're not my descendants. I do have a son who used the scholarship and graduated. But my expectation is that they continue the effort. So I hope they do. Maybe they want to stand up. <laughs> <laughs> And, and there might be some other displaced Urarian scholarship recipients in this room. I, I, I don't know. Is there anybody else that has received a scholarship? Okay. All right. Okay. I think we have time uh, for one more question way up in the front here. I, no, actually, the, the mic will be really helpful. Thank you. Hi, I'd like to know if there are any more things that you think would help with reparations or restitution. Are there other things you'd like to see happen? You're asking the right person. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see some child care services here. There's a child care center at the end of at, at, at the south end of 9th Street that was included in our uh, commitments and promises not kept. And the, the, we were a working class group of people. And I know that there were single parents, single mothers that needed childcare just to get a high school education, just to walk to Emily Griffith to get the GED. So that would be the first on my list, childcare. Well, I would think that the more education, the better. I think that if, if the more people know about what happened, what occurred here during those, that period of time, I think that that would help tremendously. But I think that the university and uh, while well, the universities and the colleges need to express what happened here? I think that that needs to happen. I think that the, the universities and the colleges need to educate the students. They need to educate the faculty. They need to educate anybody coming through here. I think that that would be a one, one excellent way of recognizing what happened so that everybody knows exactly what occurred. So I, what I want to point out as we uh, begin to conclude this panel is that we began by hearing histories, right? Mem remembrances of the neighborhood, particular family stories. Um, we got into the legacy of displacement when we discussed the impact of the Displaced Rarian Scholarship. And this final excellent question prompted us to think not just about the connections between this displacement and the deeper um, and historical ones that we're trying to make connections to, but also what uh, reckoning might look like, what kinds of other ways besides hosting symposium or extending the reach of the scholarship would be ways of addressing the kinds of stories that you're hearing today. And I, I hope that we will all continue those conversations. 
So please first join me in thanking our four panelists and the audience for engaging in that. I know that there were far more questions than we could get answered in this panel slot. So if you want to come up and chat with the folks up here afterwards, I'm sure they'll be delighted to talk with you more. Um, there are a few things that I wanted to remind folks about in terms of what, what's coming next. Um, so in our lunchtime slot, there is lunch available outside of this room. Um, and I'd ask that everyone please let our elders um, get in line first uh, for that, and then everyone else is welcome as well. There are multiple opportunities to continue engaging with these topics during the lunch session. One of those is the first offering for the walking tour, Auraria as we remember it. So if you're planning on joining that tour, if you signed up, go get your name on it if you have it. Um, it will leave from 1230 just outside. Um, additionally, we're going to have a lunchtime discussion in this room led by Milo Marquez, um, one of the members and leaders of the Auraria, Auraria Historical Adv Advocacy Council group that you've heard reference to from some of our panelists up here. Um, that discussion will be about not just AHAC, the organization, but about what the future of activism might look like on this campus and beyond. So if you're especially interested in this question that we just heard about what else is there, what else do you wanna see, former residents, what else do you think you could envision on this campus, that would be a great place to join in. And then finally, you also heard reference up here, I think from Nancy, to the Auraria Library. The Auraria Library is on our campus. It's shared by all three institutions here, and it has a rich collection of primary historical documents that connect us to some of these histories of displacement. We are lucky to have a representative, a librarian in the back here, Dot Donovan. Hi, Dot, thanks for coming. Um, who is here to talk with anyone who's interested about what the collection has for not just displaced Aurarians and their descendants, but also any community, community members who are interested in learning more about the future of that collection. So I'm eager for us to engage um, with her as a representative of, representative of the library and special collections to think more about how we document and then get the word out about many of the stories that you've heard here today. Marjorie, is there anything else that you wanted to announce? Come on up. <laughs> We're just learning about the challenges of running a symposium in this space. And one is that we couldn't bring the lunch in through the front doors. It has to come in here. So lunch is not yet set up. So hold your horses. We're gonna bring it in through this door and it will shortly be available in the back. Um, and uh, we can continue this conversation informally if people wanna come up and um, lunch will be served soon. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Um, my name is Milo Marquez. And I'm a fifth-generation Denverite. Uh, I grew up in East Denver. Uh, my grandmother's family grew up here on the in this in the West Side 